Hi and welcome to the We Are Zion Sermon Podcast. We are a local church based here in Chennai, India. We are so glad you are with us and hope that this will encourage, inspire and instill fresh faith in you. We have Jer and Nicholas teach us from the book of Jonah today. Jonah seems to be known for the big fish or great fish, but it really is about the one true God who is big and who is great. A God who calls us to life that is lived best when we follow him, are obedient to him and find our identity in him. Let's listen in and see how we can see similarities between ourselves and Jonah and begin to draw closer to our God. Hello everyone. As always it is wonderful to be back. Um so we just got done with our series on the Psalms and today um we're going to start on a two part series on the book of Jonah and I'm really excited to be talking about the book of Jonah today. Uh so before we get started I'm going to go ahead and say a word of prayer and then uh, we'll get into it. Okay. Heavenly Father we thank you so much that um we can come to you. We thank you that uh, we can gather here in your name. We thank you that we can gather here around the scripture that you've given us. We thank you for the safety and comfort in which we gather, Lord. Father, we ask that uh, as we recognize the comfort with, with which we gather, Lord, we always bring to mind. We always bring to our mind and our attention, Lord, and the people around the world who follow you. who seek you lord who find their identity in you who have chosen to believe in you there are people that are unab- that are not able to meet this comfort and safety lord so father we ask that you would move things that you would make a way that they are able to gather in safety that you would change the governments around them that you would change the minds of the people around them lord that you would bring to fruition what i'm sure they earnestly praying for is to gather um to have the freedom to worship you lord uh, in community lord so father bring these things to pass we ask that uh, you would be with them at this time that you would be their comfort that you would be their security that you would be their peace that uh, you would be everything they need at this moment so father as i speak today please help me to be clear in what uh, you have for us um please help me to be confident in what i am saying lord um communicate through me lord we ask that it would be your words that are spoken help me bring to light the things you want to draw our attention to lord and uh, help me not to be distracted by things that are not important uh, at this moment but draw us to the things that you want us to learn from Jonah chapter 1 father we love you we thank you for this time in jesus name we pray amen so as i mentioned earlier we are going to be doing a two part series in the book of jonah and so we won't be dwelling on every chapter so today we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter 1 and i think next time we're probably going to be looking at Jonah chapter 3 i believe 3 or 4 i haven't quite decided yet but today i know for sure uh, we're looking at Jonah chapter 1 so the book of Jonah is actually one of the great books of literature uh, in our scripture um it had as i was reading through it it talked about the depth of all the literary devices used in it uh, there's so much in here because the story that's been really well written uh it kind of made me want to go back to college and do my degree all over again but this time actually pay attention uh, so but it it excited me to read about the book of Jonah and as i read through the book of Jonah two three times it is such a great story and i i don't mean story as in fiction i mean it's such a great narrative that's been given to us for us um to see and gain uh, what god has for us and to see the character and nature of god within it as well and actually as you find out see ourselves in it so it is a great book to read uh i encourage you 
that if you have not read the book of Jonah or it's been a, a while since you visited it, go ahead and read the book of Jonah. It's actually quite a quick, quick read. You can read through it in one setting. Um, it definitely, uh, after you hear this message, go ahead and read it as well. So it is a great book. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and read the entire of read the entirety of chapter one. And then as you probably used to by now with me, we'll go a couple of verses at a time and see what's happening, look at some details that are interesting, and then come back to it at the end to see what we can take from this. So I'm going to read uh, Jonah chapter one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. They, so they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will be calm. It will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back the land, but they could not. For the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So that was Jonah chapter one. For many of you, when you hear the word Jonah, the only thing that comes to mind might be verse 17. Jonah and the big fish, Jonah and the great fish. Or maybe Jonah and the whale. So reading children's stories and being focused on that, many times we hear the word Jonah and that's exactly directly where our minds go to. But this book is just so much more than Jonah and a big fish or Jonah and the whale or some people think Jonah and the shark. Whatever great marine animal you have in mind is so much bigger than just Jonah and this animal. It is not a book about a great fish. It is a book about a God who is big and a God who is great. Um, so, and we will see that here. So, looking at uh, verses one and three right now. So, we'll go verse by verse. So, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went to Joppa where he found a ship. Bound for that port, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. The book of Jonah starts like many other prophetic books. The word of the Lord came to Jonah. So the majority of the prophetic books, like the minor prophets, start with the phrase, 
It came to the word of the Lord, came to Amos, or the word of the Lord came to Micah or this prophet. But they proceed to go on to tell us what the word of the Lord is through the prophet. So the prophet starts speaking the word of the Lord. Um, so if it was the word of the Lord came to uh, Amos, then it would be Amos talking about what God has for Israel, or what God has for people. So he would be speaking. However, this prophetic book, or this book of Jonah, is drastically different because rather than us hearing uh, from God through Jonah, we see a story about Jonah. So this is the only prophetic book where rather than the prophet speaking uh, the words God gave him, he hears the word that is to go to Nineveh and preach against it. And then it is followed by a story rather than pretty much the speech of Jonah. So that is something that's very different, something very unique. So this, in fact, is a story. It's a narrative. Not fiction, but it is a narrative. It's a story. So, and then go to the great city of Nineveh. So Nineveh is a very important city in the Assyrian Empire. Uh, it is so important, in fact, that some years after the incident or wherever Jonah is placed in history, it does become the capital of the Assyrian Empire. So it is a very important city. Uh, it's a large city and eventually becomes the capital. Uh, so the important part is that it is an Assyrian city. Uh, the Assyrians were, they were enemies of uh, Israel, Judah. Uh, but the, the, the Assyrians were very cruel, cruel people. Uh, when I say that, I, I'm mainly talking about the way they went about warfare and conquest. Um, they took great pride in how cruelly they treated the people they were conquering. Um, they went to great lengths to record uh, their exploits in warfare. And this is not, I'm not talking about they recorded all the battles they won, as in they um, defeated this enemy or that enemy. They went to great lengths to record in detail how uh, they treated their enemies after they were conquered, meaning how they tortured the prisoners that were con conquered. Um, the different, in their ways, probably very imaginative, creative ways to deal out punishment, to deal out cruelty, to deal out torture. So there are, even to this day, there we have discovered reliefs where this has been um, recorded, right? With, and so many of their art revolved around the exploits they had in war. So you can go look this up if you want. But uh, And uh, the Assyrian kings were very focused on people remembering them for their... Um, for their uh, wins or for their for the exploits in warfare as well. So they went to great lengths to record uh, the number of people that died, the number of prisoners that were taken, but more than that, the cruel ways in which they were treated. Uh, cruel is the only word I can come up in the English language to uh, talk about the depths or the extent to which they went to torture their prisoners, right? Uh, I can't think of a worse word, so I use the word cruel. But just to give you an example of um, what I mean. So one of their chosen uh, forms of tor torture is when many times they captured uh, an enemy. They would bring out the people in power and they would uh, skin them while they are alive. So this, this is a very... Cruel is not the best word, but that's the only word I can think of. So this is just a small image of what they would do to their enemies when they were captured. Uh, in fact, the Assyrians are the ones that are responsible for the annihilation of the 10 tribes of Israel. So uh, the state of Israel went through a civil war. There were 12 tribes in total, but then it slipped to a southern kingdom and northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel with 10 tribes and the kingdom of Judah with two tribes. And Assyria is the one that's responsible for destroying the kingdom of Israel, that's the 10 tribes, and taking them away, and eventually 
the tribes assimilated into other things, and those tribes are called the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. Um, the kingdom of Judah that was taken to Babylon was allowed to return and establish, um, go return to their home again, but that's not something that happened with those 10 tribes. So this is the kingdom we're talking about. Nineveh is an important city in this kingdom, this cruel kingdom. And this is the kingdom that God is calling Jonah to go and say, preach against it. Okay. So they are enemies of the state of Israel and God is calling him. So Jonah decides to run away. So this idea that uh, because it's wickedness has come up before me, uh, come up before me isn't like God going through Instagram stories and all of a sudden he sees something, it comes up before him and he is aware of what's happening. He is aware of everything. It is just verbiage to tell you that he's about to act. Similar to when uh, the Israelites, uh, the people of God were in captivity in Egypt. And then there's a phrase that said, God remembered his people. He had always known that his people were there. He was very, um, he knew about the plight they were in, right? He was constantly watching them, but he remembered as in he was about to act. So just like here came up before them as in God is getting ready to act against uh, Nineveh. So Jonah ran away and headed for Tarshish. So ran away. Is it a literal running away or is something else? Um, so this is Jonah, a prophet of the Most High God, the prophet of the one true God. It is probably certain to say that he knew he couldn't literally escape God somewhere, as in go somewhere where God can't find him. Uh, so we can kind of take that as granted. So what does it mean to run away? So run away from God has this idea of like running away from his presence. Uh, for instance, God's presence was associated with the temple. That is where God's presence was. So in a sense, what Jonah is doing is trying to run away from God's presence because that is probably where he heard. It is likely that he was at the temple when he heard this call to go to Nineveh. So he might, so him running away is like him running away from, in a sense, from God's additional instructions or God's voice. Or in other words, he's running away so that God will choose somebody else to do this. He doesn't want to do it. So him missing from Israel, missing from the temple might mean that God will give the duty that he's given Jonah to someone else. So if he feels like he won't be there, God might give it to someone else and he doesn't have to do it. So it's not like a literal running away per se that God can't find him, but it is a, I'm going to leave so that maybe God will find somebody else to do it. And uh, Tarshish is interesting. Um, it is difficult to really know where Tarshish is. Uh, so most as we have some ideas or speculation, there is a very similarly sounding city uh, in the Straits of Gibraltar. So all of this is happening around the Mediterranean. Uh, so in the east part of the Mediterranean, you have the Kingdom of Israel and all the way across the Mediterranean on the west part are the Straits of Gibraltar. And we believe that is where Tarshish is. So it is in the Straits of Gibraltar, which is the passage into the open ocean, the open sea. So as far as Tarshish is concerned, it is uh, Jonah's way of going to the ends of his world. So Tarshish is as far away from Israel as he can get. So he is going to Tarshish. So it's like the end of his world, because beyond that is the open ocean. So he's going to the end. Of, it's almost like saying he's going to Timbuktu. He's going somewhere very far away. So that's his plan go as far away as possible. So verses four, then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. So verse four, a great storm comes, right? A, vi a great wind, a violent storm threatens to break up the ship. Um, so the sailors in this boat were probably Phoenician. And the Phoenicians are the ones that pretty much uh, controlled the trade by sea in the Mediterranean area. So they were probably very seasoned sailors used to storms. But this storm is so violent that they are afraid, right? And then 
in their fear, they cry out to their own gods and they start throwing cargo, which is precious for them because they're traders overboard. So it is quite a storm. Here, um, we see that each cried out to his own God. Um, it, it doesn't mean that all of them worshipped um, very different main deities. They may have worshipped the same main one or two deities. However, their own God talks about these uh, familial deities, as in each family probably had some kind of deity that was associated with that family. And the reason for this is the idea was you couldn't possibly go speak to the main God. Okay. In order to speak to the main God, you needed these intermediate lowly gods that you could go talk to. And then they would go bring up your concern to an intermediary one. And then it might go up the chain of command, eventually reaching the main person or eventually re reaching someone that was responsible. So the idea here that each to own God doesn't may not really mean that everyone had a main deity, but that each one had a deity that was associated with their family, a familial deity who they could go to. And then this deity or this demigod or small god would run with it and see who is responsible, how they can be helped or maybe pass it on to someone else and eventually it gets to the council of the big gods who were really in control. And uh, maybe there was a chance that they would be rescued. So in this case, they would want rescue from the storm. So they'd be praying to their gods. So then after they throw stuff overboard, they look for Jonah. Because what is Jonah doing? He's asleep. So but Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how are you asleep? Or how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us that we will not perish. So here, uh, the irony is not lost, right? A pagan sailor who is, thinks that he cannot go to God, the big gods himself, that has to go to a small God first, is calling the prophet of the one true God, the prophet of the God most high, to come and pray. Uh, there's a little bit of irony there. Uh, so the strategy, at least for the sailors, into calling Jonah to pray is thinking back to this multi-theistic uh, hierarchical view of gods for them, right? If they could include one more god in their prayer, the chances of their prayer being heard or answered are greater. As in, maybe of the five, six, how many, we don't know how many sailors, of all the sailors, maybe adding one more. So maybe we have 20 of these familial deities running around to see if they can help us. And eventually, maybe one of these deities will make it into the council where all the big gods are and present their case, at least see if the big gods can intervene or find the god who's responsible for the storm and go and appease them, right? So it is about increasing their chances of uh, getting a result or getting stuff, getting away from the storm. So that is the reason for that they would have said for uh, Jonah to get up and pray. So after they wake up Jonah and call him to pray, they decide Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who was responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who was responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? So normally, lots are not cast to find out a guilty party. Uh, normally in this time, lots are cast normally to find out order or order of things. Uh, lots were cast even in the temple to see in which order the priests would go and uh, so lots, the idea behind lots is not that they're cast to find the guilty party, but just to find the order. But here, that is the initial impression we get, right? They're going to cast lots to find out who is responsible, as in who is the person guilty here. But if you see when the lot falls on Jonah, they don't accuse him. They don't say, you are the reason. They actually proceed with a the question. They say, 
who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? Tell us who is responsible. So they're really not blaming Jonah, but they're getting curious in a sense and asking him for more information. Maybe as in which God is responsible. Maybe even, hey, Jonah, have you, is there some kind of sin you're running from? Is that so? It is not this you. Why have you done this to us? It is, okay, let's find out what is happening. So it's a very interesting uh, picture we get of the sailors, right? Do you think that in this very stressful situation, the lot is cast on somebody in the moment that is cast you get this blame but you they just have more questions so they ask him all these questions who is responsible for this cal calamity where are you from what do you do which people do you belong to and then jonah answers he answers i am a hebrew and i worship the lord the god of heaven who made the sea and the dry land and his response if you see, uh, to his answer, if you see the sailor's response, it is, this terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? This was not a response they were expecting, right? They are so consumed with going to these uh, small gods and asking for help for them to take it up a big god that they are confronted with this person who says, I am a Hebrew. And I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, as in I worship the big guy, the guy who made the sea and the earth. So, and this terrifies them. It fills them with fear. And they ask him, what have you done? Right? So for them, it's almost like they're trying to get to the council in a sense, the big gods to get help. But here stands up this prophet and says, I know the one true God. And uh, so they asked him, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. Uh, <clears throat> this could be either in passing, Jonah had told them what he's really trying to accomplish by getting Tarshish, or maybe in this event, he happened to give them insight into what he was running away from. Um, we can't really be sure, but what we can know is that the sailors have... Um, it has come to light what Jonah has done. So the sailors know what he's doing or what he's running away from. And then, so the sea starts getting rougher and rougher. And so they asked, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? And Jonah has a very simple, straightforward response. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know this is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. So they ask him, what do we do? How do we make the sea calm? And he responds, throw me off the boat and everything will be fine. I am the reason this has come upon you. Pick me up, throw me out. Things will be okay. But the way they respond to his request is very interesting, right? Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not for the sea grew wilder than before. So they did not immediately pick him up and throw him, right? It's almost as if they value Jonah's life and they decide, you know what? Let's not throw this guy. Let us try to save his life or let us at least try to take him back so his God can deal with him. So they start rowing, but to no avail, right? It starts with a violent storm that threatens to break up the ship. Then it gets rougher and rougher. And then it says it grew wilder. So the storm is progressively getting worse. And then after it gets wilder, they reconcile the fact that what they must do now. But it starts with a request almost for forgiveness. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you, Lord, have done so as you pleased. It's almost a confession of faith, almost. You, Lord, have done so as you pleased. So it is like they have gotten the idea of who this God might be, and they want to make sure that uh, they don't do something that this God might perceive as wrong. Uh, so they are open, and they're letting him know that 
please don't us don't hold us accountable for this person's life right um don't please do not let us die please do not punish us for taking this guy's life right you are a god who does what he pleases so they say this and then they take Jonah and they throw him overboard and as they throw him overboard the sea grows calm and when they see this there is this almost this moment here where they have like this act of faith uh, as a storm or so at this the men greatly feared the lord and they offered a sacrifice to the lord and made vows to him so here offering the sacrifice making vows it's not clear that these men decided to become a, a part of israel a part of god's people but what we can see is there is some act of faith here where there is a recognition that this god either is different or this god is the one true god we just can't be sure what this act is i guess what i'm trying to say is many times or sometimes we read this text and take this as a oh they definitely became part of god's people it's not clear uh, but what we know is they feared the lord and there is this act of faith where they offer a sacrifice and uh, they made vows to him so as you read through this chapter 1 you see the contrast between jonah and the sailors the sailors almost appearing more faithful then the prophet of god who is clearly running away or absconding or whatever word you like to choose but there is this contrast right a lot of irony here where the sailors seem to be doing the more faith filled kind of behavior rather than throwing him overboard at the first thing uh, they try to honor his life by trying to row um they make sure they uh, they let god know to spare them because they're about to throw this in what they think is innocent man overboard um they're the ones that are initially praying uh, when everything is going crazy and it, they don't point the fingers at them and accuse the moment the lot falls on him so a lot of contrast between Jonah and the sailors right and there's a lot of irony, irony in it because these are pagan sailors right who don't feel like they can go to the big god so they have to go to small ones against the prophet of the true god the prophet of the one true god the prophet of the most high god so it's interesting contrast there is irony but there's also a message in there for us so now jonah's overboard the sea is calm and we come to verse 17 the one that we all remember the story for now the lord provided a huge fish to swallow jonah and jonah was in the belly of the fish 3 days and 3 nights the point of this verse is just that god provided a fish right it's not to tell you that it was this particular species of fish or it was a whale or a shark or anything it was a big fish it was a huge fish this idea of large great gets repeated through jonah right it's a word that's used very often it's part of the way um the story is written just like there was a great wind a violent storm right there is this huge fish that comes up and swallows jonah swallows jonah whole and jonah spends 3 days and 3 nights in the belly of this fish so many times at least sorry me this story was part of my childhood growing up in a christian household and the focus was always this part that jonah was swallowed by a fish or eaten by a fish right it wasn't until uh, later on in my 20s or later 20s that was, that i was reintroduced to this book uh by the missions pastor at the church that we used to attend back in the states and when he walked us through this book during a bible study for a small group it really changed my perspective on the purpose of this book and it really changed my perspective on this provision of the fish so i used to think that this jonah being swallowed by the fish was punishment for his 
disobedience because God said go to Nineveh. He said no, thank you, I'm leaving, and he left. <coughs> so yeah, he clearly was disobedient. And then I always thought that the fish was there to punish him. That was his punishment. That he was to be in prison for the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, and that was God taking what punishing him for the his choice of disobedience. But looking at this, I can clearly see now that this was not punishment, but it was rescue. God was rescuing Jonah because without rescue, his plight in the sea was drowning. His plight in the sea was death. So God provides a big fish to swallow him up in order to rescue him. So this act of this fish showing up and swallowing him whole is an act of God's great mercy. It was not punishment. It was rescue. God rescued Jonah from drowning. God saved Jonah's life through this fish. So it was a rescue plan. This was not a plan to punish Jonah, but it was a plan to rescue Jonah from the incredible plight that he found himself in. From his life being taken away, this was a rescue to give life back. So, and this is, uh, you know, this idea of rescue, right? It's also similar if you look back to the garden. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and they ate the fruit. So it says God clothed them with hair and then they were banished from the garden. So many times we even view that and we look at that and we're like, God punished them, right? But we sometimes skip over that very important verse that says that um, God said that they did not want them to eat of the tree of life and live forever, as in live forever in their broken state. What kind of life would that be to live forever in that broken state, in that sinful state, right? So again, there, it was God rescuing them from that. So him taking them out of the garden, leading them out of the garden was a rescue, just like here. So there it was rescuing them from this eternal life of suffering. Here it is a rescue from death and drowning. So in both these things, things that we may have seen as punishment, it really is a rescue. God's MO, his modus operandi, is not punishment. His modus operandi is rescue. So, and that is what we see here. He is there to rescue us. So, what, what does this mean for me? How are we here in the book of Jonah? So, I think for me, the book of Jonah is a mirror. And we look at this mirror and we think we're about to see, or we look at Jonah is a mirror. We look at Jonah and we might think we will see Jonah, but what we really see is a mirror. We see us. We see us in Jonah. Um, Jonah was called to do something. Instead, he chose to be disobedient to do something else. Now, I'm just not talking about uh, God calling you to do something specific and you being disobedient. I'm just talking about we as Christians, right, we know and we believe that the best way to live life is to believe, follow, and find our identity in Christ. Christ life is best lived through him with our identity in him, right? But many times we tell ourselves, you know what? Sure, but now at this moment in time or for this aspect of my life, I think life is best lived uh, through me, as in I want to choose or I want to do what I want to do, and I decide life is best lived through me or life is best lived through my choices rather than following in obedience to what uh, to how life is best lived through God. I'm going to choose and say that life is best lived through me and go about this. But as we see, as we see in Jonah, when we decide that life is best lived through us rather than through God, there is 
drowning. However, that is not the end, right? There is always rescue. Rescue is always there. It is imminent. It is coming. Rescue is continually happening, right? Rescue is not something that happens once in our life. God rescuing us is a continual thing. He is constantly rescuing us, right? Many times when we decide life is best lived with us and there's a moment where we're drowning or there's a consequence to a choice we have done, our minds go to and that, that we are being punished or something like that. But in reality, God is rescuing us through those events or consequences. God is bringing us back to him. He's rescuing us because we belong back with him. We belong where we belong at a place in life where everything that life is lived best through him. Life is lived best through faith in him. Life is lived best by finding our identity in him. So I think that is where we see ourselves in Jonah. So I'm just not talking about like maybe you heard God tell you to do this and you chose not to do that and did something else. I'm talking about in our daily lives, right? We know <clears throat> that there are aspects in our life where we have told ourselves that this part, I am going to do what I want to do. I do not want to be obedient in the ways that God has called me to be. I don't think in this aspect, life is best to live through him. is going to be best lived through me. So we operate out of ourselves in these areas. It could be any aspect of your life, right? But what we see in Jonah and what we see through our scripture is most of those decisions that are based on self lead to drowning, but there is rescue. So God is here. We see this, that he is a God that rescues. He is con constantly rescuing us. So as we see ourselves in Jonah, I think we should take a moment and reflect on our life and look at what are these areas where we might be telling ourselves that I am operating uh, through myself or I am looking at myself rather than or living life, sorry, living life to the best through me rather than God as being our source, rather than being obedient to God, choosing to do what we want to do in these aspects of our life. And when we recognize those things, we repent and call God to rescue us because he is a God that rescues and he will rescue us. If we just move on one verse to Jonah chapter 2, uh, verse 1, it says, From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, to the Lord his God. And he said, In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. So, when we find these areas in our life where we've decided, you know, it is best lived through me, it's not best lived through God, I think we can cry out in our distress and God will rescue us. Just like he answered Jonah, he will answer us. And then we repent and we come back and he will rescue us, right? So let's have a look at our lives. There are so many aspects to our life, right? And we like to put them in compartments and say, all of this, I'm okay being obedient to God. And in, in this part, I really don't want to be. But let's look at those parts where we tell ourselves we don't want to be and we want to just do what we want to do. And think through it. Come to a point of repentance where we understand that even those aspects, it's not best lived through us, right? When we take it all on us, at least in Jonah's case, it led to drowning. And I really think that's what, what that's what the doing things on our own, doing things through us leads to that. So let's look at those things and repent and bring it back where even those things come under God, those things come under, uh, that we are obedient in those things to God. So, um, as so we will stay with Jonah for the next week, but this coming week, 
what I would like for you to do is look at Jonah chapter two. Read all of Jonah, definitely, but focus on Jonah chapter two. Look at how Jonah repents, right? And let that be um, an example for how we can repent and bring those things that we have held on for ourselves back into obedience with God. So I think that is the message, at least for Jonah chapter one for us today. There are probably several, but for us today from Jonah chapter one is that Jonah, when we look at him, we see ourselves. Many times we tell ourselves that we know what's best and we do our thing. Uh, however, what we know is best and we do our thing many times leads to drowning. But if you're drowning, God will rescue you. He's a God that rescues and he will bring us he will bring us up and he will bring us back to him because the focus of rescue is to bring us back to him. Uh, but if we notice those things in our life, we can go to him in repentance and ask for rescue and he will rescue us as well. So as we go through this week, let's have a look at Jonah chapter two, read it and see how Jonah responds in repentance and look at areas in our life where we want to respond in repentance and bring those areas back into obedience to what God has called us. So when we come back next week, we'll, I think we're going to be looking at Jonah chapter three and see, uh, what Jonah, I mean, what Jonah has to say from there. Uh, but this is the message for us today that God is concerned with rescuing us and he wants to rescue us and he wants to rescue us from the things that we have taken on ourselves where we want to have control, but he's eager and he, it's important to him to rescue us from those things, to bring us back to him and bring those things under obedience for him. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to end with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through your scripture, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that we can learn about you and learn your character, learn who you truly are through the pictures and who you have painted for us in scripture. Uh, thank you for this book of Jonah. Thank you that it does reflect, that we can see our own reflection in Jonah, that we can see our own reflection throughout the book, Lord, that we many times are so... We give in to the temptation to lean on ourselves, to look within us for everything. We tell ourselves that I know how to best do this, or I know how life is best lived, and we take control, Lord. But Father, we know that life is best lived through you. We confess that for us to have an abundant life, the good life, Lord, is through you, is through faith, in you is to follow you is to find our identity in you lord so father we ask that in that you would highlight areas where we are to come to repentance that you would bring us to the position of repentance lord and that we would cry out to you to rescue us lord and in those areas lord no matter how difficult they might be we ask that you would rescue us that you would do the work lord that you would bring us back just like you rescued Jonah that you would miraculously rescue us and bring us back because Lord some of those aspects that we are looking to ourselves are so difficult to let go Lord they are difficult and painful Lord to let go so we ask that you do the work Lord enter our space rescue us rescue us miraculously like you rescued Jonah and bring us back to your word. So Father, we love you and we thank you that you are a merciful, loving God who is constantly rescuing us, Lord. We love you. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we will see you next week for Jonah part two and uh, receive this benediction. May the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. So go out in the power of the gospel. Thanks for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. To hear more messages like this, make sure to subscribe and check out our podcast channel for past episodes. If you like what you are hearing, consider rating us, subscribing, and even sharing it with friends. That would really help us. 
For more content from We Are Zion and to connect with us, go to wearezion.in. Remember, whoever finds Jesus finds life.